Welcome to another edition of Mind of Christ. We are making our way through the Gospels, and we're following the sequence of uh, A.T. Robertson's Harmony of the Gospels. And we're looking at everything Jesus said, everything he did, in order to determine the mind of Christ, how Jesus thinks. And today we have a relatively short um, section to cover, and I'm going to limit myself to this one section today is section 60 if you're following along in A.T. Robertson's sequence. And this is about the second Galilean tour that Jesus made and it really focuses on the women who traveled with Jesus uh, in that second tour. So we're going to be looking at what we know about uh, the different women that are mentioned in this section. The section is found in Luke chapter 8, 1 through 3, and we will begin by reading. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible uh, because it's a very literal translation, and that's what I have used to study uh, the mind of Christ with. So, starting in verse 1 of chapter 8, Luke, And it came about soon afterwards that he began going about from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses, Mary, who is called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. So we have a number of facts, if you will, to consider here in this particular section. It would be interesting to know if Jesus had some particular strategy uh, in these visits that he was making. And remember, this is the second Galilean tour that he has made. I can't imagine they were just random visits, just happened to go here or there. Jesus was an itinerant preacher. This was typical of Jesus's work. In the pioneer days, this was more common. I think they were called circuit preachers. The churches could not afford to have a, quote, full-time preacher, so one man on horseback uh, or buggy would travel from place to place preaching. Paul seemed to do much of this. This pattern is still practiced by some, but I rarely hear of anyone saying it is a pattern that we must follow to be like the early church. We do tend to pick and choose the patterns that we want to follow. Perhaps the, the distinction between a city or a village was maybe one of size. He visited both, but he did the same in both. He both preached and proclaimed. And uh, there is very little, uh, I think, difference between the two. Uh, he preached or proclaimed or evangelized, it says, just different aspects of the same principle or practice. Um, he was in communi communication with the, uh, with the people concerning the kingdom of God. This is where his kingdom ministry began, and he's still on this subject. Remember, he started his ministry by talking about the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and he's still uh, talking about the same thing. He has a, a theme that runs throughout his ministry in his kingdom of God. He had good news to share, and he's getting the message out uh, in these uh, cities and villages that he's uh, uh, visiting. Luke details those who traveled with Jesus. We would expect the twelve, as they came to be known, to accompany him. Now that he has designated them as apostles, their training uh, is fully underway. But traveling with such a group required support. It seems a bit strange that the support came from these women. I am not sure what to make of this, really. In general, he says they had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. They were grateful women who had received a specific touch from the hand of the healer. Uh, they obviously wanted to help and to be near him. I am sure their individual stories would be very interesting to hear and to know. But little is known about them. Of the three named, Mary Magdalene is the most well-known. 
Mary Magdalene was exercised of seven demons. So much conjecture has been conjured up surrounding this woman. The most tantalizing is the notion that she and Jesus were lovers and actually married and had children whose descendants live on the earth today. Here is what we have on her from Scripture, though. Um, <clears throat> we're not going to get into all of those speculative things out there floating around. Here's, here's what we know. There are several scriptures where she's mentioned. Matthew 27, 56, Mark 15 and verse 40, and John 19 and verse 25. She was among the women, which included Jesus' mother, at the cross, uh, watching from a distance. Matthew 27, that's uh, Matthew 27, verse 61, says she sat across from the grave when Jesus was buried. She was accompanied by the other Mary, quote unquote. In Mark 15, 47, Mark tells us that this other Mary was the mother of Joseph. They wanted to see where Jesus was buried. In John 20 and verse uh Verse 1 says that Mary Magdalene arrived at the tomb very early while it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away. Matthew 28 and verse 1 tells us she was with the other Mary, quote unquote, at dawn at the tomb. Mark 15 and verse 40 says the other Mary was also the mother of James the Less and Joseph. Mark 16 and verse 1 says Mary Magdalene and the other Mary was also accompanied by Salome, or Salome, and that they brought spices with which to anoint him. And some think this incident, uh, this indicates that Mary was the center of, of Luke chapter 7, who anointed his feet with perfume. You remember Jesus said on that occasion, she is preparing me for burial. Uh, and so some have associated uh, the two here. Mark chapter 16 and verse 9 says, After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. And in John 20 and verse 18 says that Mary was the one who announced the resurrection to the disciples. She says, I have seen the Lord. These are the only recorded words of Mary Magdalene. I have seen the Lord. So here's what we know. Let's summarize this. She was among a group of women, not a single tag-along, who traveled with Jesus at least on the second tour of Galilee. Number two, she was at the cross with the other women, including Jesus' mother. Number three, she was with others. She with others was at Jesus' burial. And number four, she was one of the first to see the empty tomb. Number five, Jesus appeared to her after his resurrection. Number six, she announced Jesus' resurrection to the apostles. And then lastly, she called Jesus Lord. And may, perhaps there's one more thing that we need to add here that's already been stated. She had seven demons whom Jesus cast out. Now that's what we know about Mary Magdalene uh, directly from Scripture. In Matthew 28, the angel speaks to the two Marys who have come to the tomb to anoint his body with spices. They were shown uh, the empty tomb. They were sent to inform the disciples that the tomb was empty and that Jesus was going before them into Galilee. As they were going to report, Jesus appeared to them and they took hold of his feet and they worshiped him. Jesus gave them the same message about meeting in Galilee. Mark says three women came to the tomb, Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James, and Salome. They brought spices and uh, wondered how the, uh, they would move the stone away from the, from the cave. They had the encounter with the angel called a young man here. Uh, fears and astonishment gripped them Mark adds in 16 and verse 9 that he first appeared to Mary Magdalene. Luke indicates the women saw uh, where the tomb was, uh, Luke 23 and verse 55. They prepared spices to anoint him with after the Sabbath was over. Uh, the they 
of 24 verses 1 and following is the women. Luke says that two men appeared in dazzling apparel. A similar message was given. The women were identified as Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and also the other women with them. It seems to be Mary, it seems to be many women at the tomb, though Mary may have been singled out for a special audience with the risen Jesus. John says that Mary came to the tomb early and reported to Peter. But later, after the disciples went home uh, in John 20 and verse 10, Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. She looks into the tomb and she sees the two angels. And then Jesus appears and asks her why she is weeping. She thought he was a, a gardener. And when Jesus saw her or said her name, uh, he said her name Mary, she recognized him and she was, quote, clinging to him. To a, in, in other words, she was attaching herself to him. She was touching him. And Jesus told her not to do that. Okay, so let's ask the question. Did Mary Magdalene have a romantic attraction to Jesus? Well, who knows? And even if she did, so what? As Jesus walked the earth and as people were figuring out who he was, there had to be a variety of responses that were maybe some not proper had they realized exactly who he was. But these are normal human experiences. Did these inappropriate, quote-unquote, responses present a temptation to Jesus? I assume they did, just as those who saw him as a king. Satan used that to tempt Jesus to bow down to him in order to gain lordship over the entire world. The Bible says he was tempted in every way as we are, and he experienced temptations common to man. So did traveling with these women, especially with Mary Magdalene, present some difficulty? Perhaps. Where did they stay when they traveled? What types of conversations did they have on the road? Did others suspect any attraction or flirtation, etc.? And was anything said? But Jesus managed whatever it, it, whatever it was, whatever happened, he, uh, he managed it well, all without sin. And so I'm going to allow the possibility that there was some attraction there. But for Jesus' part, he managed it well. And even if he were tempted, because the Bible says he was tempted in every respect like we are, then he obviously did not allow it to go into becoming a sin. Now, let's talk about Joanna for a minute. Joanna was married to Chusa, and it says that Chusa was Herod's steward. This was Herod Antipas that we're talking about here. Herod Antipas, son of Herod the Great, who tried to kill Jesus as a baby. Antipas had a steward, perhaps his treasurer, and his name was Chusa, who perhaps was a believer in Jesus himself. This presents an interesting insight that Jesus' spiritual influence extended even into Herod's court, and wealth from that court flowed to Jesus. Was Herod aware that he had believers among him or disciples in his midst? This shows the leaven of Jesus uh, as it permeates every segment of society. Was Joanna at risk for her service to Jesus? Remember, this is the Herod before whom Jesus stood on trial before his crucifixion. Perhaps he, perhaps he had been encouraged uh, to believe in Jesus by his steward, but maybe he mocked such an idea as he did at the trial of Jesus. Did Joanna provide, quote, intelligence regarding what the Jews were doing uh, to, to try to silence Jesus. In other words, she had a kind of an inside track, what was going on politically, 
And when Jesus was becoming more the focal point of the ire of the Jews, um, perhaps she had some insight into what they were planning. And perhaps, and again, all these are speculations, perhaps she uh, alerted Jesus and the apostles about what was happening. Well, all of this is maybe. And if it did happen, it would certainly be interesting. All right, we're switching to a new journal here. We're uh, in book number seven. Uh, uh, this is seven of 21 journals, so we're only a third of the way through uh, the mind of Christ. Well, so continuing, other than the note here, we know nothing about Susanna, uh, other than the fact that she was healed by Jesus and that she had some wealth or some means by which to support him. So what are we to make of this reference? Some have inferred women leadership in the church. Some have inferred a harem. Can either be justified by the evidence given? I think not. But it does show Jesus included these women in his ministry. They were allowed to be with him and to help. They are held up in the text as useful to him and respected for their services. Some have assumed, and it is not far-fetched, that these women had a special ministry to hurting women in the towns and the villages where Jesus went. So I don't think it would be far-fetched to think that these women who travel with Jesus would have had a special opportunity to minister to other women uh, in the places where they visited. They were not apostles, but they were certainly disciples and were in a perfect position to testify to Jesus's ministry. I wonder if Luke interviewed these women in prep for his book. It seems likely that he would. I wonder what perspective he got from a woman's point of view. Certainly, boundaries are important when men and women travel and work together, but such is possible uh, for them all to keep holy. Now that's all I've written on this subject of the of the women in this section. I told told you this is a relatively short section, but I also want to tell you why I'm not uh, going to go ahead and start the next section at this point. Section 61 is a rather long section. Uh, it is uh, recorded in both Mark 3. 20 through 30 and Matthew 12 22 through 37 so you can see it's very a very long section uh, it, and this deals with the subject of the blasphemous accusations uh, against Jesus uh, ba basically saying that he was in league with Beelzebub that he was doing the things that he was doing because of Beelzebub now um, this is the section where it's going to talk about the unforgivable sin, and there, there's a lot contained in this section. I don't even know if we're going to get through all of it in the next uh, recording that we do, because it is quite long, and it is involved, and it is a, has some very difficult uh, material in it. Uh, but I wanted to let you know that that's why I'm going to separate these two subjects. And so even though this is a relatively short version of the mind of Christ today. Um, it's just the way it happens sometimes uh, because of the material uh, and, the, and the arrangement of the, of the material. But again, but again uh, thank you for joining us. And if you would like to go back and, and listen and view uh, other editions of the mind of Christ, uh, you can go to our website, centralsarasota.org. And you'll have links to everything that we've done as well as other series that we have done. And, uh, um, and so just invite you to explore uh, on our website and thank you for joining us. If there's anything we can do to help you or to encourage you, we encourage you to, um, you can go to our website. There's a place where you can email us or there's some phone numbers there too and you can give us a call. But again, thank you for joining us today and I hope you have a blessed day. See you next time. Thank you.